Listener discretion is advised. At each store, she asked the employees and their customers, is there a little boy in here? Have you seen a little boy? Each negative fed her panic. Back in the street, she searched once more around the small play area, like the slide where she had left Eric only minutes earlier. So then she placed a desperate phone call to the police. Unfortunately, I'm sure you can guess where this story is going. Hello and welcome to True Crime, the podcast that helps you find new, emerging, and undiscovered independent true crime podcasts. I'm Greg, the host and curator of True Crime. Today's episode is from Murder Incorporated. Murder Incorporated is two best friends podcasting about true crime. One eats true crime for breakfast, and the other is a newbie. If you like today's episode from Murder Incorporated, make sure to check the episode description for links to subscribe. All right, we're going to get this show started after a quick word from our sponsors. Begin. Hello and welcome to an undisclosed location. This is Murder Incorporated. I am Buddy. And I'm Harley. And today we'll talk about Charles Ray Hatcher. Charles is a man unto himself, a serial predator, the type in your heart you pry your children never fall victim to. His sex drive alone with alcohol took many lives over the span of two decades. And with that, I'll leave it over to Harley for this gruesome tale. That is a good word, buddy, gruesome, because that is exactly what this is. So I've heard. And very tragic. Buddy, that was excellent. I just want to thank you. The listeners want to thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all. Amazing intro. I I do it for you. I do it for you. I do it for all the listeners out there. The millions. It's all about you. It really is, too. All right. Karen Carter's frantic cries, unanswered, shoppers in and out of the store are just looking away at her as she's screaming for this kid. She's screaming his name, Eric, Eric. Okay. The little boy's babysitter ran from shop to shop. Oh, man. It's terrifying. It really, like every babysitter's nightmare. Oh, yeah. And she's thinking, like, how far can a little boy go in five minutes? Yeah, you'd be surprised. Once or twice, Karen would stop quickly inside, expecting to see his blonde head. At each store, she asked the employees and their customers, is there a little boy in here? Have you seen a little boy? Each negative fed her panic. Back in the street, she searched once more around the small play area, like the slide where she had left Eric only minutes earlier. Mm -hmm. It was completely deserted. No kids. So then she placed a desperate phone call to the police. Mm -hmm. She said, yes, I'd like to speak to somebody about helping me find a little boy. Where are you? I'm at the mall. The downtown mall? Yeah. Okay, whereabouts in the mall are you? And she says, Mantrax. Buy Mantrax. It's like the It's like a play, like the name of the mall. Ah, oh, yeah. And this is like an outdoor mall, though. It's not like. And she says that he has a red and blue shirt on, blue jeans, blonde hair, and so they interrupt her, asking again what he's wearing. And she says, red and blue shirt, blue jeans, and blonde hair. Okay. And he's a white male. Yeah. How old? Four. And um, his height. Um, she's a, and she says three and a half feet. All right. And his weight? He's thin. I don't know. That's okay. What's your name, please? Karen Carter. Karen Carter. Okay. Well, they said, Ted, that they'll get somebody down there right away. Mm -hmm. As she waited anxiously for the police to arrive, Karen wondered if something had happened to make Eric want to run away. Mm -hmm. That Friday, May 26th, 1978, had begun like many others for Eric Scott Christian and Karen Ann Carter. They met bright and early at the Walnuts Product Company. This is a business owned by the Christian family and managed by his father, Adwin Christian. Okay. Karen was a wood inspector, but sometimes she'd babysit like once or twice a week. A wood inspector. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get a wood inspector. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah, that is a pretty funny name. You think they come up better than that? <laughs> Wood inspector, also known as a sex worker, buddy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. You need to inspect your wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like a bad porno, <laughs> yeah. the wood inspector. <laughs> Sorry, and, we, we definitely are uh, children here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
misogynistic, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. According to that review, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we might as well bring it on the other. So we got a review, not on our feed, yeah, but on uh, Riddle Me That, their feed. Yeah. Saying that we were misogynistic and that what, what was the other thing that? Mi- uh, misinformation. misinformation. Yeah, yeah, that we, we spread misinformation. misinformation, which is like, okay, let me tell you one thing that is like I do my research. And I don't even put something in an episode unless I it's verified. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't just like go by what Wikipedia says. I mean, I go to Wikipedia because they will put good sources at the end that you can search that, but not what's yeah. on Wikipedia. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. On, on top of the top of the misogynistic, I mean, I'm pretty sure both of us are feminists. So yeah, I mean, I mean it's <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable to me. Yeah, we may joke, but we are definitely not misogynistic. <laughs> Anyway, let's just keep moving on. Yeah, I mean, we don't we don't really care about any comments or what. No, you know, if, you, if like, you want to comment to us, then feel free. You know, that's whatever. You know, it is what it is. We're gonna do what we want. They're this lucky there's podcast. no reply. I heard right. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> this is our podcast. We don't care if you don't like it. Don't listen. Yeah, if exactly. you like it, we appreciate you. We we respect you. And we we thank you. We don't do anything to that, hurt people. Exactly. You know, nothing. We, we try to really not intentionally. Yeah. Exactly. But if you do have a problem with it, you could always email us. And this person must not be able to spell incorporated because, <laughs> no, I'm serious, because they wrote Murder, Inc., oh, which yeah. we are not Murder, Inc., we are Murder, Incorporated. Yeah, so that is true. That is true. That's like, you know, even people that don't listen to us, they can't even spell incorporated. <laughs> so it's like, don't feel bad, listeners. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. I just want to say really quick, last week, three times, neither one of us caught it. The last episode we did, both of us said, you sent a different email that was wrong, and then I sent a different email that was wrong, and then we just both kept going as if we both sent the same email and it was right. Nobody, neither one of us said anything. <laughs> no wonder they're not emailing us. <laughs> <laughs> like, you said, like, something, and then I said something. I can't remember, but both of us said the wrong email, and neither one of us caught it, and I'm like... It's murderincorporatedpod at gmail.com. Yes. So, yeah, email us, Twitter us. Free postage, so there's no excuse. That is true. That is true. It had been a day of animal crackers, strawberry pop, cough drops, and candy. Oh, man. That afternoon, he talked with his mother, Vicky. She asked him if he wanted to come home. And he told her no, he was having too much fun with Karen. Later, Karen took Eric and his dad's nice, brand new white Cadillac on a series of errands around the city. First, she hauled home a desk she planned to refinish. Then she stopped off at a store to buy supplies. And finally, she headed for Mantrax on a patriotic mission. A patriotic mission? What does that mean? <laughs> so, Is she going to like, start a civil war or something? Like- <laughs> the Memorial Day weekend was approaching, buddy. Okay. <laughs> and Ed Christian had asked her to buy an American flag to display. All right. It was after she parked the car and they were walking towards Mantrax that Eric spotted the slide. And he wanted to go on the slide. Obviously, every kid would. Mm-hmm. I want to. I want to. Walking towards the store, Karen gave in to Eric begging, and she let him go go on the side while she ran into the store for just two minutes, whatever it would be. Oh, man. As she entered, she saw Eric uh, run to the slide and climb the ladder. Karen went to the back of the store where the flags were located. She selected one and paid for it. When she emerged from the store a few minutes later, Eric had disappeared. Mm -hmm. As she anxiously... Mold over the day's events, Karen reassured herself that nothing unusual had happened, that there's no reason why he would want to run away willingly. Mm-hmm. He seemed happy, and nothing had come between him and her to make him want to run away. Although he was only four years old, Karen knew Eric was not a child to thoughtlessly wander like away from her. You know right, what I mean? Right. It didn't take long for officers to arrive to interview the babysitter. And she's like horribly distraught at this point. Oh, I can imagine. She's like, I had the little boy with me. I parked the car and got out and went to the mall at Mantrax. The boy wanted to play outside, so I went in and got the flag. It took me about five minutes. When I came back out, he was gone. And what year was this again? 1978. All right, so there's not security cameras all over and whatnot. So. No. And there's no Amber Alert. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the police, the horrible police in this situation just screwed everything up right from the beginning. Oh, I was going to say that now. This is going to be a lot like the Thompson case. Oh, really? Where these cops are just completely incompetent. Karen believed that she had entered Mantrax at about 2.50 p.m. She estimated she had spent like seven or eight minutes searching for Eric before she called the cops. Mm -hmm. Her telephone call to the police department had been logged and tape recorded at 3.01 p.m. 
to the police, this was not just another lost child. They recognized immediately that the missing boy was the son of a wealthy and well-known family. Oh, jeez. Walnut Products was one of St. Joseph's best-known companies. One of Eric's uncles had even held elected office in county government. Oh, really? Christian was to the city of St. Joseph what Hearst, Bush, and DuPont were to other big cities. Okay. The officers asked Karen to describe the boy again, and she quickly repeated what she had told the dispatcher. She did not have the chance to tell them how the police were moving quickly. Four officers immediately began searching the mall and the surrounding office buildings. When the police told Edwin, Christian, the terrifying news that his son was missing, he mobilized the considerable resources of his family and his company. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. His two brothers, Kenneth and Dennis, and their father, Kenneth Christian Sr., came downtown to help look for the boy. Yeah. While they hunted on the ground, the company plane circled low over downtown. Oh, wow, the company plane, huh? When Yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> when the police department's second shift came on at 4 o'clock, the day shift officers remained on duty and continued the search. Detectives joined uniformed officers, and the reserves were even called in. Soon wow. there were not even enough police cars to accommodate all the men on duty. Oh, wow. Yeah, they, they had some pull there. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. was, you know... Well, you know, you don't want to get into it, but if this is some poor little freaking black cat, there'd be three cops looking in the, <laughs> not that. in the right spot. <laughs> yeah. So, in the tangled woods and empty lots between downtown and the Missouri River, two men rode on horseback, and a third used a motorcycle. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Along the riverfront, searchers checked inside the vacant warehouses and abandoned buildings. That's a nationwide, or that's a area-wide manhunt just going on for just this little boy. That's crazy. And how quick was this? This this seemed like very fast. Yeah, so she called the police after she realized seven minutes, mm-hmm. and then the police arrived four minutes. So it's 11 minutes after the search started, you yeah. know, it gained momentum, but right, it, right, obviously. 11 minutes after he had gone missing. Yeah, it happened so quickly. Yeah, I mean, if you are like the richest guy in town, yeah, everybody owes you a favor. Of yeah. course, they're going to stay. And you know what I mean? Like. Yeah. The, the cops can't say, oh, well, it's too expensive when you're paying half the taxes or whatever, yep. you know? Yep. Two city workers were ordered down into the sewer systems to see if Eric was there. Detective Robert Eaton joined the case at 4 p.m., and he was disgusted to find that no officer had taken charge and organized the search. Eaton began to methodically direct the search efforts, and still there was no sign of Eric. Okay. As the day of Eric's disappearance turned to night... The police and volunteer searchers continued their search. When it was finally dark, the command post was moved to police headquarters, where Detective Eaton continued to man the telephones and radios. Members of the Christian family stayed in the same room with him, and they hung anxiously on each call with the hope that the boy would be found. Mm-hmm. At midnight, Eaton took a new, a new tack. He split the searchers in half and directed one group to begin from downtown and work its way south. He told the other group to begin at the Wood Company and work its way north. He believed that per- perhaps Eric had decided to walk to his father's office and had become lost. Oh, yeah, my daughter was four like a month ago, so yeah. But Do you think your daughter would ever do that? No. She has a healthy fear of everything because I'm her father, so <laughs> you know what I mean? She thinks everybody's a serial killer already, so. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right about that. <laughs> no, she does. <laughs> Oh, daddy, that guy's got a knife. She like was he's like probably gonna kill us, isn't he? No, honey, he's just she's just cutting the Santa. hand for us. <laughs> yeah, <that's Santa. laughs> Why does Santa have a knife? <laughs> Is it though? <laughs> he thought that before the two groups of searchers met, Eric would be found. You know, before they meet, because they went two ends of the town and then came to the middle. At three a.m., there was still no trace of the boy, and the search was called off for the night. Mm-hmm. They agreed to meet at 7 o'clock in the parking lot of City Hall. 7 a.m. in the parking lot of City Hall. Eric Christian disappeared long before the Amber Alert system was created mm-hmm. to help cops and the public react quickly when a child had been kidnapped. Yeah. The requirement in 1978, in the absence of a ransom demand, 24 hours would have to elapse before the FBI would enter a case on the presumption that a kidnapping had taken place. Okay. But... Joe Holtzlag, the FBI agent assigned to St. Joseph, 
was flexible, open-minded, and willing to gamble that his help would be needed. Thank okay. God. That's good. So as police and volunteer searchers combed the city streets, Holtzlag summoned a squad of six agents from Kansas City to begin preliminary work on the boys' disappearance. They brought along a mobile command post, which was basically a cramped van packed with electronic gear, and parked it in front of the Christian home. They used it to monitor developments in the search and were prepared to record and trace the ransom demand in the event the kidnapper, tele- kidnapper telephoned. Hostlag risked embarrassment, especially from his inconvenienced fellow agents, should Eric turn up in like a lost and found department somewhere. Mm-hmm. So it was like a good thing that he was willing to take the chance, you know? Yeah, I agree. On the day of Eric's disappearance, the agents came to the front door of the Christian home. He sensed that he was stepping into a major case, but at that point, Hostlag had no idea of his dimensions. He had no way of knowing he was on the threshold of a crime that would come to dominate his entire law enforcement career. Wow. But when Eric's abductor was finally brought to justice, the facts turned out to be so weird, the unsub, so evil, (laughs) it was way beyond what any police officer would ever expect to encounter. And this is 1978. I mean, this... This context is very important. Okay. St. Joseph. I'm listening intently. Oh, you always are, buddy, and I do appreciate that <laughs> because you always do seem to be listening. or You're very good at faking it if you're not. <laughs> yeah, I am good at faking it. Yeah. St. <laughs> Joseph cops accepted and respected Holtzak as a quiet and friendly FBI agent who helped them out and who would sometimes and who sometimes needed their help. His early involvement in the Christian disappearance was welcomed and reassuring. The local police opened up to him, and they even furnished him with all available information and the, allowed him immediate access to even a few witnesses in the case. So they were, like, op- welcoming, him, welcoming him with open arms. Mm-hmm. This openness was uh, in sharp contrast to what would happen years later when St. Joseph finally discovered what really happened to Eric. Mm-hmm. By the time Holtzleg had investigated the way the police had handled the case, and the chief of police had threatened to go to the FBI headquarters of Washington, D.C. to stop him. Oh, really? Hoetzlag's friendship with local lawmen had been, you know what I mean, shh, shh, gone. <laughs> I'm not good at sound effects, buddy. No, you're not. That was a throat slitting. It was, it was the Got best the chalk. It's the best you could do. It's the best I could do under these circumstances. <laughs> okay. Edwin Christian had broadcast an announcement on TV that night that he would pay $10,000 for information leading to the safe return of his son. Wow. While the search, which back then, that's like, $100,000, buddy. Yeah, I believe it. While the search for Eric was still underway, agents had begun getting info about Karen Carter by interviewing her neighbors. Ah. So she would be the first suspect. I I, I would think so, too, yeah. Attention had focused on her based on the theory that the kidnapping had been set up Mm -hmm. with the babysitter providing inside information to the kidnappers. That's a good theory. Definitely. Definitely. Just run every angle. Yeah. I mean, they have nothing else to go on. So just hours after Eric disappeared, Karen took a lie detector test at the St. Joseph Police Department Mm -hmm. and uh, she passed. I would think so. She doesn't seem like the type, even though I barely know her. I just, I feel, I got that feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I trust all wood inspectors myself. <laughs> Me too. You know what I mean? Even if she failed, she passed. No one questions the wood inspector. No. We'll talk about the <laughs> sobriety room took the test. <laughs> God, we're horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I think we forget that we're talking to a whole audience and not just me and you yeah, I know. joking around. <laughs> it Walk wouldn't up. be you, Walk you up. and me if we didn't, though. Yeah, you're right. Back to the show, folks. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, I, I'm now at an undisclosed location, which sucks because I should have become a Patreon and Murder uh, Incorporated okay. podcast. Okay, ma'am, what's your location? Uh, I just told you. I don't know. It's undisclosed. But it all started when I got this call from Harley and Buddy telling me to join their Patreon or else. Okay, ma'am, that's awful, but yeah, I need of to know. Of course I don't join because prank callers, am I right? Ma'am, I just need to know. But no, this, this wasn't a prank call. Harley sounds like he's from the mob and Buddy... Pff, He's anything but. He's just not your buddy. Okay, ma'am. So can you give me a description? So then buddy comes to my house and and these people basically threaten me by sneaking into my crib, 
completely torturing my dishwasher by filling it up with unwanted dishes. Okay, so they broke into your house. And get this, the drone of the vacuum is never going to leave my memory, as I'm sure Ma'am, if I do live through this anyway, you're, I will you're need gonna... many years of some kind of mental health treatment. Okay, ma'am, I'm just going to... even unwound my garden hose and folded my laundry. Ma'am. Those sons of bitches. But if you could also kindly help me, I'd so appreciate it because I'm being forced with threats of cleanliness to my home. Oh, okay, ma'am. I'm going to need you to calm down and tell me what the actual state of your Maybe emergency... Maybe if you all join their Patreon, they'll untie me so I can go back to my humble abode and turn it right back into the filthy abyss that is where I lay my head at uh, night. Okay, ma'am. Uh, I... At $4, they'll give you some merch, I guess, and they'll shout you out in a future episode. In a future episode, sorry, I have to be quiet. At eight, you get all of that and bloopers, which, let's be real, these two are a pair of bloopers. Okay, that was... And then at 18, you'll get all of that and a t-shirt signed by the same pair of fucking tits I just mentioned. And you'll also get a one-on-two, which sounds kind of like something you never, ever want to Google. And they might even disclose their undisclosed location, which Uh, is important. Okay, ma'am, I need their height, weight, what their location... Anyway, all tears... And not the tears. I'm silently crying in this undisclosed location, fearing oh, for my life. Sweetie. But all tears donate a portion of revenue to the Cold Case Foundation. Ma- ma'am. Please help me. I hate clean stuff. Okay, please. ma'am. Please. Oh, God. Make it end. Okay, ma'am. Join their Patreon, please. I have to pee. Oh, God. Hurry. Ma'am. Ma'am. Hello. Ma'am. The disappearance of one of its little children hit St. Joseph like a natural disaster. I mean, this is horrible. This is the first time anything like this has happened in 20 years. So, I mean, as long as some people have been alive there. Yeah. At 7 a.m. Saturday, 200 searchers came together in the City Hall parking lot to help look for the boy. And even dozens more volunteered to serve them coffee and food. Okay. Reports of sightings were processed. Several people reported that they had seen a little boy with a Buster Brown haircut, walking with a man downtown Friday afternoon. Oh, really? That's a good lead. Yeah. The most promising lead came from a man who said he had seen a blonde boy and an older man at about 3.30 p.m. walking along the railroad tracks. Oh, really? Robinson gave the information to Eaton, who was still directing the search with just three hours of sleep. Nearly two miles away, it was the roughest area the searchers were asked to cover. Because of the dense forest and the river. The mm-hmm. river, like, bled into the ground and made it, like, mud, you know, like. Okay. So it was hard to search. Charles Jones was working his way through the dense undergrowth. He was a member of the Citizens Band Radio Club. I'm not even going to do an alert. I'll let one of the listeners do it. <laughs> but we all know. We all know. Jones had spent most of his day covering the difficult drain. Okay. He said everything was overgrown. It's real dangerous. It's like a jungle, he said. Okay. There are no paths whatsoever. You just have to make them yourself. So he's just randomly running through these woods train and thinking that's... Because the train tracks lead out that way? Yeah. Is that why? Yeah. Okay. With him was his brother-in-law and his sister-in-law, George and Karen Goldsizen. Goldsizen. Brother-in-law and sister-in-law? Yeah. I don't know where his sister and brother are. (laughs) Like sending their significant other, <laughs> they can't stand their brother. Um, at dusk, Jones scrambled along the base of the steep bluffs that the river had carved through the centuries. As another sunset approached, between six thirty and seven p.m., buddy, Jones came across something he had not seen all day. Oh, a path. Oh, so that means. If you've seen a path where there are no paths, you know what I mean? It recently must have. Yeah, yeah. The weeds were trampled enough to show that something or someone had cut through the area recently. Uh Could have been an animal. A few steps down the trail, he first saw the boy's red and blue striped shirt. And then his lifeless body. Saw that coming. Just beside him rested a bird's nest. It was filled with eggs that were as blue as Eric's eyes. I forgot to say earlier, he has beautiful blue eyes. Hmm, Sounds like someone I know. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Sounds like someone I know. Karen Goldzizen. Eric was lying on his back on top of what appeared to be an altar of broken branches, as if he had been the victim of like a pagan sacrifice. Oh, wow. The body was about one quarter mile north of town, so kind of far on on foot, you know what I mean? But not 
Not that far. Okay. Yeah, it, but how far was that from uh, the shopping mall? 20-minute walk. Okay. So he made it 20 minutes before he was killed. Yeah. At least, you know. It's terrifying. They, I, know, I know this is a statistic. I mean, most of mine are made up, but this one is that if it's not for ransom, I might have wrote it down here, but if it's not for ransom, that the child is dead within, like, the first hour. Yeah, you can imagine. So if you're not rich and your kid goes missing, you might as well not even look for him. Yeah. That's I mean, horrible. you have to look for him, but it's yeah, truth. It's the truth. No, you're right. You're 100% right. That's, that's fucking, that's freaking terrifying. Yeah, it is. Eaton saw a group of people walking through the woods from the road. Police Chief Glenn E. Thomas was leading them, and at the rear were reporters and photographers from the St. Joseph News Press. Okay. Eaton tried to stop them, but in minutes, the crime scene was contaminated. With the police oh, chief leading geez, them. jeez, are you kidding me? Like, what? Oh. Any hopes of getting any clues were lost completely. Yeah. It was unclear from the first report whether the body was found in Missouri or on the Kansas side. Oh, really? It was that close to the border? Yeah. Wow. And for several confusing minutes, authorities did not know what jurisdiction would handle the case. Oh, wow. That's, well, that's terrible. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, that slows things down. Yeah, it does. One of the FBI agents assigned from Kansas City telephoned the Christian home from a spot near the crime scene. He confirmed for Holstag the fact that the body was found in Missouri. Okay. Well, we're out of it, at least officially, Holstag said. Joe, you ought to be down here. Why? They're screwing up this crime scene, something terrible. We've got press up here walking all over the place, taking pictures. They haven't put up a police line. The body's still lying up there. Oh, wow. They are trampling any footprints that are still there. Wow. And he tells them, back off and forget it. It's not our case. We're not going to get into telling them how to run a crime scene. Oh, man. Hostleg hung up and ordered the agents to pack up the special truck and return to Kansas City. For now, the case that would one day haunt him belonged to other jurisdictions. Wow, that sucks. And now he had to tell Edwin and Vicky Christian that the searchers had found their son. And it had to be done quickly. The report of the grim discovery was quickly racing through the city. Sometimes it was incorrect, though. At the Hoof and Horn restaurant near the old stockyards, conversations halted when the owner interrupted the dinners of more than 150 people, including Buchanan County Prosecutor Michael Insko, who's a douchebag, I'm just going to say now. Okay. There was applause when the restaurant owner announced that Eric had been found alive. Oh, <laughs> really? A few minutes later, the owner's wife apologized and said that Eric is dead. Thank God his parents weren't eating there or something. Yeah, exactly, right? We're terrified or, or any family member, you know? Yeah. And then the room became as quiet as a church, they said. Telling the Christian couple that their son was dead was the toughest thing Holtzog ever had done. Wow. I mean, so, I, can, I can imagine how tough that is, but yeah. it's, it's, you know, the toughest thing we've ever done. I guess that, that ranks up to probably one of the toughest things that I think anyone would have to do. Maybe you meant, yeah. like, up to that at that point, you know? I, I, don't, I don't know. know. I, mean, I mean, probably telling someone your child's dead is probably going to be one of the hardest things. Oh, I, I could do. not do it. I oh, could no. not do it, man. No, not at all. Statistics collected by Harley Newell say <laughs> when a child is abducted in something other than a parental custody fight, the chances are one in ten that he or she will be found alive. What a terrible statistic. Many are never found, and those who are, about 115 a year, are found murdered. The Christians had spent a sleepless night worried that a parent's most feared nightmare might visit them. When the news of Eric's death finally arrived, like, you know, they have grief, anger, frustration, I yeah. mean, everything. Yeah. So I wonder I wonder if this this killer actually knew, like, the boy that he got, or if he just got a random boy. Oh, you'll find out. Okay. We will Fair find enough. out. Right. The information as to how Eric died made it an even deeper hurt uh -uh. and forced Eric's parents to wonder about what kind of person could kill a little boy that way. Yeah. I, I kill a little boy, period, but I'm assuming that it's even gruesomer than the thing. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, it is. Later, Hoslag accompanied Ed and Vicki Christian to St. Joseph's Hospital, where they observed the body. Vicky wanted to reach out one more time to hug Eric, but police told her not to touch the body. Of regional, what, buddy? I'm just like putting that in my head, and it's just like it's just terrifying. 
Yeah, I think I think about that when I cases like this get me thinking. Yeah, like I would be that parent, just like put me in the goddamn grave with him. I, you know I, what I mean? I would be the same way. Yeah, I really. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to think about it, but it's like you have a true crime podcast. You do think about it. I mean, yeah. that's what like keeps me up at night. I think, God, just seeing one of my kids, like you know what I mean? I would just be like, like shaking. I'm like, wake the fuck up. Yeah, yep. wake up. Yep. There's got to be something you could do. Wake him up. Yep. I'd be it's the same way. <sighs> it's terrifying, man. Yeah, it's it like is. when we did uh, James Bulger. It's like that just... That That's just, a that, whole nother level. <clears throat> that rattled me to a core. That's know? a whole nother level. You know what I mean? Knowing yeah. that not only did your kid die... I mean, there's wait, you, there's being murdered, and yeah. then there's being tortured. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, it's just... Whew. Yep. How do you ever, ever survive that? Yep. I don't know. I don't know. I, I have no idea. Stronger people than me. <laughs> you ain't kidding. I don't think I, I can. barely keep it together as is with my kids fine. I can't imagine, oh. you know. Thank yep. God, you know, we live where we do. Oh. Not that everywhere is safe, but some places are safer than others. Yeah, compared to really like New York City and whatnot. I mean, yeah, you know, like Chicago and all that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, buddy, later that night, the director of the Regional Crime Laboratory in Kansas City examined little Eric. He took samples from his body and placed them in plastic evidence bags. He believed a forensic pathologist was needed. Okay. And shortly after midnight, Dr. James Bridgens from Shawnee Mission, Kansas, arrived to perform an autopsy. He concluded that Eric had been sexually abused. Oh, man. And asphyxiated. Although the precise method of murder was not made public, Bridgens told investigators that Eric had not been strangled. But it had died as a result of an act of oral sodomy. Oh my god! Oh, I totally forgot about that. I totally oh forgot about that. God, what Brit- a sick bastard! Oh wow! Oh my god! <clears throat> Hold on, let me take a minute for that one. I totally forgot about that. Oh my god! Oh fuck! <laughs> All right. <sighs> oh my god! I totally forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, man, that's like. Oh, fuck. I wrote this a while ago. I, like, totally forgot about that. I was thinking he got choked to death. I don't know why. I must have, like, blocked it out of my head. You know what I mean? Yeah. I hope I can block it out of my head. I must have. (laughs) Fuck. He would lose consciousness in three minutes. And there would be irreversible brain damage in seven minutes. And I'm sure that the kid put up a fight. Because even babies put up a tremendous struggle when something is blocking their airways. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God, man. Other pathologists might have been more professionally cautious, leaving themselves some room by offering other possible causes of the asphyxiation. Okay. But for whatever reason, this doctor's like, no, this is what happened. I, I don't... This is what happened. He said there's no other explanation. Oh, my God. So I don't know why he was so, like, emphatic about it, and I don't want to know. Yeah, honestly, it's that's just... I, I'm, I'm just going to... Error on the no, I don't even want to do that. You know, because justice needs to be said, and the sicko needs to be seen as what he is. But oh my god, that poor kid! Jesus. It was explored the next day in the pages of the newspaper, who were totally unprofessional, buddy. Everybody in this case is totally unprofessional. That sucks. The only one that gave a shit. Well, I don't want to get. I don't want to ruin the story, but is okay. these cops suck? Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. this town sucks. Oh, this wow. kid deserved way better. Then these idiots. Mm-hmm. How does the chief of police, when a four-year-old is just found murdered, the chief of police lead the freaking media there? Yeah, I agree. How? Like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you do that? You're the chief of police. You need to know, like, we need to find this guy. We need to figure out. We need to keep this crime scene completely like uncontaminated. You, yeah, contaminated. exactly. Like, yeah, what? what is it about ratings? Like, <laughs> you know, especially with such a, such a high-profile case, you know? It's like, what in the... But no, I'm sure it was all about in his head. Like, all right, we found the body. We we gotta we gotta make sure everyone knows about it. Yeah, like, we found it. Yeah, all right, we found yeah, it, not the yeah, FBI. You know, yeah, exactly. It, it was more of a ratings thing and whatnot. It had like, to be ridiculous. And this is even worse. A front page photograph because he let them in of Eric's body. Oh. With his pants unbuttoned. Oh. <laughs> was on the front page of the newspaper. Man. That would never happen today. No, never. I mean, it's no illegal way. anyway, but now, Gee. I don't know. That's pretty horrible. That's wild. Like, readers wondered what 
sewer the murderer has, was hiding in. And others, enraged by the newspaper's use of the photo, wrote letters to the editor complaining that it was in poor taste. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone should have wrote that letter, and the editor never should have put it out. No. No. Within hours of Bridgen's gruesome finding, a special police unit was forming to find the murderer. Now, this is the Northwest Missouri Major Investigation Squad. No miss. No miss, huh? Which had yet to handle an investigation, <laughs> would be initiated with the Christ or Christian case. Okay. Officers from the city, the Buchanan County Sheriff's Office, and the Missouri State Highway Patrol filled its, you know, roster. The lead investigator was Sergeant, Sergeant Anderson, a 21-year veteran of the State Patrol. Anderson had been part of the investigating team since he was, since he had observed Bridgens perform the autopsy. Eaton was on the team, too, and at 7 a.m., after only four hours of sleep, he was back at the crime scene digging for evidence. Host Slack's supervisor told the FBI agent to act as, like, a liaison with Nomis, okay. providing them with any assistance that they needed. Mm -hmm. Anderson and Host Slack were respected as a team. They were friends, too, like, outside of, they bowled together and stuff. Okay. Host Slack believed Anderson was the best interrogator he had ever seen, so that's saying a lot. Wow. A public appeal was made for information on the killer or killers. Invaluable leads were filed among useless tips, gossips, and rumors. Mm -hmm. All information was filed on index cards were passed out to officers during the morning meetings. Index cards, what a great system. Yeah. Think about how, how technology was advanced. Like They used index cards before. Yeah. Not just like, doo -doo -doo -doo, type them. Or any paper at all. It's like <laughs> it's gone. Like, what is paper? <laughs> yeah. The investigators worked round-the-clock shifts, sorting and checking the cards. On Monday, day two in the life of Nomis, the police set up roadblocks on the routes from... Yeah, a little late. Set up roadblocks on the routes from the downtown mall to the spot where Eric's body had been found. Now, what are they going to be looking for? I mean, they don't have a suspect yet, so... What are they setting up roadblocks for? So... <laughs> Honestly, they don't... They already fed the body. Uh, yeah, it was like... I don't know. The police talked again to Jeffrey Davey, who whose initial report had helped lead to the discovery of Eric's body. On the day of Eric's disappearance, Davey, a plumber, had driven to MacArthur Drive to remove dirt from the days from the clay cliffs there. Okay. He needed the dirt to fill a site he had excavated in a plumbing job to help unlock the secrets of Davey's memory. The police brought in Maynard Brazil to help unlock... The okay, keep going. Just Sheriff Jack Flack had asked Brazil, an instructor at the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center, to help with the investigation. He was a former Kansas City police lieutenant. Brazil was the Midwest's trailblazer in investigative hypnotism, preferring to call the technique focused concentration. Ah, uh, yes. Or as I like to call it, bullshit. <laughs> I mean, that's just my term for it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't agree with you more. That would never work on me. All right. I, I'd like to try it. I'd like to see if someone Oh, I would to love it. to see if it could happen. Yeah. I would love, like, a real good guy to see if he could do it. Yeah. He had been hypnotizing crime witnesses and victims for exactly a year, having attended the Law Enforcement Hypnos Hypnosis Institute in Los Angeles. The courts have since all but put an end to the use of hypnotism in criminal cases. I can't imagine why. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it, it's, it's such good knowledge. It's like pure facts. Yeah, it was weird. Pulling it right out of their memories. Yeah, it's not like you're creating memories. No. What? <laughs> in 1978, hypnosis was just one of the several new investigative techniques the police used. Mm -hmm. So they're like, screw all this like police work. We're just going to like <laughs> hypnotize these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, makes our job easier. Why not? Right? Yeah, they're like, <laughs> you hypnotize him, Bill. I'm gonna go out for coffee. <laughs> Dangle that coin in front of his eyes. That's all we need. On Tuesday, Host Slag sat in Brazil's session with with Davy. An artist supplied by the Kansas City Police Department was there too to sketch any descriptions that might emerge from the interview. Ah, yes. Brazil asked Davy to relax. For a few minutes, they sat there, with the only sound being Brazil's periodic suggestion that Davy relax and focus his eyes. After a few minutes, Davy's eyes became fatigued. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, now he's, he's moving in for the kill. Jeff, I am taking you down, down, down into a deep feeling of relaxation. We are on steps, and we're going to go down them one at a time. We'll take each step one at a time. Buddy, I'm trying to hypnotize the listener. One, two, three. Now take your phone. Go to patreon.com <laughs> forward slash murder incorporated. Sign up for four dollars a month at, at little just just think about it. Okay, back to the case. Wait, wake up, people. <laughs> Davy's eyes had begun to droop. So basically, okay, long story short, he's hypnotized him, right? Okay. Put him in a trance? Yeah, he put him in a trance. <laughs> Hang on. So basically they say it's easier to tap the subconscious memory of those who are more intelligent than those and those better able to concentrate. Davy yeah. responded well to hypnosis and was able to recount intricate details. Like what? Is there a oh yeah, so he says, Is there a car in your rearview mirror? He's driving. Okay. Is there a car in your rearview mirror? Yes. What kind is it? A Toyota. What color is it? Yellow. Is there anything in front of you? Yes. What do you see? A truck. Is there anything special about it? It's carrying fireworks. Can you see the license number? And then he like reads off a license number. Really? Hmm. Um, so that's basically it. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, the mind is definitely a crazy thing where you can, you know, definitely probably trick it into remembering more than it, you do. But how, how useful is that information? Okay, I understand. I believe that 100% that you could, whatever, get into a trance and remember stuff. That's one out of the 50 that you do yeah. that actually works. Yeah. I so agree. you can't use that as an investigative tool yeah, when... That's, that's exactly the truth. It's like yeah. a lie detector test. Yep. You know, if if it's only accurate 10% of the time, how accurate is it at all? Yeah, exactly. You can't use that. I definitely believe that, like, things that you can remember by being hypnotized, if you can be hypnotized, you know yep. what I mean? Yep. That you could find out stuff that is real. But you could also misremember stuff. You could also, whatever, mm -hmm. get suggested. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know. Yeah, it's not it's not um reliable. Yeah, if that shit was reliable, they'd, just, they'd solve every crime because they'd freaking hypnotize, hypnotize anybody. You know yeah, what I mean? Saying, yeah. So there goes our hypnotist listeners. Yeah, every week we got to freaking alienate somebody, buddy. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> We're getting more downloads, though, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they like us beating on them. <laughs> awesome if that worked when I hypnotized them for Patreon. Yeah, right. Everybody's just, beep, 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 our, things, our bells and whistles are going off. All right. He did not want to taint the session with suggestions. Instead, he allowed Davy to tell him what he had seen. Oh. But, like, he gave him a description. Mm -hmm. Not very helpful, I don't think. So we're not even going to get into it, okay? Okay. I mean, if you want me to, I will, but I just think it's a wasting time. And we're, and we're like, got a lot to go, so. All right, let's do it. Was being hypnotized. Eric was buried in the Memorial Park Cemetery, which was still covered in flowers for Memorial Day. So that was probably beautiful. Yeah. More than 500 people filled the Wyatt Park Christian Church for the services. Oh, wow. I would imagine most child murder, or not even murders, but deaths are probably is a huge turnout. Yeah, I can imagine. Just to show your support, basically, yeah. you know, yeah. The funeral procession, the longest in memory, blocked traffic for 20 minutes. Wow. And motorists blinked back tears as the procession moved past. I can't even imagine. Nope. Trying not to. The police and FBI found themselves searching for a phantom, buddy. Oh, really? During morning meetings, when the frustrated detectives discussed their leads, Eaton kept returning to the description Davey had given them, and he hammered away at it. Hmm. He says, when we find that guy, we have to try to prove to ourselves that he didn't do it. So... Maybe you said it, but why does this guy think that he saw him? What do you mean? So you get a description from the... Yeah. The, um... Because he did see a boy walking with a man. Right. Okay, so he so was they the want a better description of the man and stuff. All right, yeah. I, sorry, I had to refresh my memory on no, that. No, that's fine. So. That's fine. So he says, when we find that guy, we have to prove to ourselves that he didn't do it. If we can't prove that, we've got our man. That's the right way to do police work. Yeah, Are they... True. Will they do that, buddy? <laughs> you mean it's that? Police were told a man matching the description of the suspect was living at the St. Charles. It was like a cheap hotel. Okay. A detective was posted in the hotel for a day, but he did not see the look like. In addition to the physical description obtained, the police received a profile that included the psychological background 
and likely living habits of the killer. Okay. The FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, based in Quantico, Virginia, developed the profile in an attempt to narrow the search, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, although the investigators would not realize it for a long, long time, the description of the killer of Eric Christian was, like, dead on. Really? You want to hear it? Yeah. It's long, but it's really good. And then just keep, keep this in mind, people. This description, and then who, who they go after. Based on the information and the pictures we have available to us, we feel that it was a crime of opportunity as opposed to, like, a planned situation. Mm -hmm. We feel it is simply a set of circumstances which placed Eric and the perpetrator at the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. And he took advantage of that situation. We feel that you're probably looking for a pedophile, mm -hmm. a lover of children, white, Statistically, such people will range from between 35 and 45 years old, Okay. perhaps a little older in some cases, and in that case, perhaps between 45 and 50. We feel that he's probably living alone, is unmarried, and is from a lower income background with a poor education, and if he is employed, is employed in a menial type of occupation. The time of the occurrence, or at least the abduction, would tend to indicate that he probably was not employed at least that day or was employed in some type of shift work. Statistically, the pedophile is a repeating type of offender. And as such, we feel there is a record of this individual for some form of child molestation or homosexual activity, either locally or in departments in the surrounding one or 200 miles. Homosexual activity. So yeah. So <laughs> it's not funny. It's, it's not, not funny. funny at all. So <laughs> yes, yeah, so this I'm is laughing. this is the seventies. Yeah, yeah. I guess you're right. We also feel that he has committed offenses, at least where he would attempt to abduct a child or have relations with a younger boy on numerous occasions in the past. We do not feel he is a driver or drives an, or drives a car. Okay. At least on a continuing basis. He may well have a driver's license, but we do not feel he is a normal driver in the sense that the average person drives to work and so forth and so on, whatever. Gotcha. This is an interesting characteristic, which is often seen in a pederast and is something to be considered in this area. We also don't feel the murder itself was premeditated. We feel rather it occurred in connection with the attempts of the individual to satisfy his sexual appetite. And was, in a sense, an accidental outcome, which I agree with that, probably. I think, I think I agree. The, method of, the method of the attack and the extent of the attack leaves us with the opinion that he may, he may well have a homosexual orientation with, obviously, a preference for young boys. However, he may have been dealing with older boys in the past and, over the years, has been unable to attract the older homosexual child and has had to resort to the younger boy. Well, he probably lives or works in the general vicinity of where that boy was taken. The time of day, the fact that there aren't really too many children on those malls at that time of day, would tend to indicate that he had some other reason for being in that location, other than simply waiting for a child to appear. Right. Which, that's a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. This could have a lot of meanings, whether he was passing through or getting off work or going to work, or coming and going from the bar. There's no way of knowing. However, there has to be some reason that he was in that particular area at that time of day. In about 80% of cases of this form of child molestation, which let's just call it what it is, child rape, mm -hmm. the individual has been drinking. And so the approach and information that is obtainable from bars is always pertinent in such cases. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, the bartenders and so forth, can offer some direction. But they often are drinkers and unskilled and previous offenders from lower-income brackets. One would suspect wine and beer as opposed to the more exotic drinks. Of importance is the fact that this is, or most of these people are, repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. There is no reason to think that this man will not commit this crime again. Now, whether he kills the next one or not is debatable. But we have been discussing this, and we would offer a prediction that he would repeat again by October or November of this year. 
since they usually will repeat within six months of the previous occurrence. The fact that this death may well have been accidental would indicate the possibility that he has, of course, attacked children in the past and not killed them, and that they are around with the previous knowledge of his face and description. Hopefully, previous cases can be located, and descriptions can be obtained from them. We have cases where these individuals have been employed in such occupations as body and fender men and painters, plumbers, helpers, building construction trades, maintenance men, janitors, various type of day labor, invariably unskilled and semi-skilled jobs. Very often, these people will be seen around places where children congregate. This will be reported as a man acting strange or a man who doesn't seem to have any place to go watching kids or trying to give candy to kids. Most of these individuals, particularly in this age group, tend to be something in the way of a loner as far as their job is concerned. They are not big talkers. And while there have been salesmen who fell into this category, it's very uncommon for them to be often in the company of other men. The fact that they are using children as sexual objects indicates that they feel inadequate to the idea of approaching a mature woman, or if homosexual, a mature man. And so in their inadequacy, approach a boy, a child. There is little likelihood that the perpetrator would leave town as a result of the killing itself. He may leave town for purposes of occupation or merely because there is another place to go. But it is unusual for this type of person to run from one town to another as a result of the crimes. He would tend to have considerable guilt feelings over what happened. And if interviewed, would confess if approached from an understanding, considerate type of approach. The particular type of approach is interviewing is not at all easy to do. And interviewers should prepare well when they feel they have a good suspect. Specific attention, as previously mentioned, should be given to records of child molesters and homosexuals who are interested in younger partners going back like five to seven years and in the surrounding towns also. These examinations of the records should not be limited strictly to homosexuality. However, I think it would be fair to limit them to attacks against younger individuals or at least attempts to abduct or con younger individuals to go with them, whether they are successful or not. The fact that the individual would appear to have gone up an embankment with the victim, and the fact that he laid the victim out partway up another bank, would tend to indicate that he is physically fairly adequate, and probably rather muscular. He didn't seem at least there isn't any evidence that he had trouble getting up the embankment. There's no, like, sliding marks, you know, like, whatever. A less muscular individual probably wouldn't have bothered to go up the embankment at all, but would have made the attack at the foot of the first embankment. Also, the fact that he was willing, at least, to pick up the child in such a way as to place him partially up an embankment would indicate the person is quite capable of lifting reasonably heavy material with his arms, and that both arms are at least functional. That was a mouthful, buddy. That was a lot. That's the longest one I've ever seen. But I do want to say this, um, that I got that profile directly from, well, when I'm listening to it and typing, so it might not be exact, but I mean, I did get it from Innocent Blood, The True Story of Obsession and Serial Murder by Terry Ganey. Okay. That's the book you read. Yep. A lot of the stuff, you got to think, like, how do they get that idea? Like, where does that come from, you know? When I understand patterns and whatnot. That's all it is. 100% yeah. that is what yeah. it is. It's just patterns, right? That's all it is. It's just like statistics. That's all it is. Yeah. Like they say, they interview a thousand people. And then that's all it is. It's a numbers game. That's all it is. It's a numbers game. So they find out, okay, buddy kills guys, whatever. They find out your past. And then anybody that kills that type of person, like they, and then it's like nine out of 10 of these people do this. So let's just yeah. say it's that, you know? Yeah. So buddy and I would like to give a shout out. Oh, yeah. To a very dear friend of ours yep consistently sam yes consistently sam buddy yes consistently sam is our newest patreon and we appreciate you we love you and we thank you so much and you also know how to spell incorporated yes we appreciate that (laughs) you know we a lot of thought went into are we going to become murder inc in the beginning or murder incorporated yeah it did we chose murder incorporated 
I never thought like, oh my God, people won't know how to spell it. I didn't yeah, think about that. It's a tough spelling. Yeah, I agree. And it is because Buddy and I have talked about it. We both made mistakes in the beginning yeah. of spelling it. Yep. You know, did that stop us? No. No, no, no. But of course not. Of course not. We're Murder Incorporated. Are you <laughs> kidding me? It's not going to change just because you can't spell it or I can't spell it. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I just want to say, I hope you're listening. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate your emails. I really oh. appreciate your correspondence yeah. on Patreon. Mm-hmm. You know, we appreciate it. Yeah. And we hope thank enjoying, you very much. We hope you're enjoying the content. Buddy and I, you know, we really try hard to put out good content. And when somebody joins Patreon, like, that means a lot because it's saying, like, no, I appreciate it, too. You know, so it's cool. Mm-hmm. Also, while we're in the middle of stopping the episode, <laughs> let's give a huge shout out to... A Nefarious Nightmare. Yes, A Nefarious Nightmare. They are one of our friend podcasts, I guess we would say. Amanda and Courtney, we really appreciate the really funny, which you'll hear on this episode, the Patreon. (laughs) That's hilarious. But that was made by Nefarious Nightmare, just so you guys know. (laughs) That was awesome. (laughs) Buddy and I were laughing our asses off. Yeah, we were. (laughs) It was so funny. And you guys, you will be on the joke also because you'll hear it this episode. It's freaking hilarious. Yep. Um, let's get back to the show, buddy. We're almost done with this episode, so. All right. The psycho- the psychological profile was one of many investigative tools that the St. Joseph Police Department had at its disposal. Okay. But few officers were trained to apply it. Rather than using the document to narrow the range of suspects, they used, like, a shotgun approach, hoping uh-huh. to net the killer who officers were convinced was still in town. Mm-hmm. As part of the police investigation, detectives rounded up 150 of the usual suspects. Gotcha. We interviewed every known pervert in town, which meant every known gay in town. Gotcha. No, of course, right? Um, flash. I mean, some of them were perverts, but not because they were gay, obviously. Right. But, I mean, this is, like, so scary. I literally was like, wait, oh, my God, this was, like, the reality for a gay man yeah. in America. Yeah, yeah. I, I can, I can 30 imagine. years ago. Yep. In our lifetime. Oh, yeah. It's, it's to tragic. To think that. It, yeah, it's tragic. Yeah. So you can't like, just love who you want to love. You're going to be thought as a, 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 yeah, a pedophile or whatever. You know, you're going to be looked at differently because you want to love who you want to love. I mean, it's one yes. thing to be hated because you're gay. It's a whole nother level to think that you hurt children because yeah. you were gay. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Oh, my God. That's like... Are you really, really take it for granted when you're born like a white man in America, you know, straight white, man? White cis male, absolutely. I mean, there's like how lucky you really are. I mean, you always talk about privilege. We we have the best, most privilege out of anyone, just about. So I'm not afraid to admit it. I say it 10 times a week. God, I'm lucky to be born in America. I'm a white guy, dude. I yeah, really am. Yeah, 100% right. I mean, that's, that's no question about it that we have the most privilege. And, you know, people that don't agree with that are ignorant. There goes those listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to all our ignorant listeners are gone now, buddy. But we'll bring them back because we're misogynistic also. Oh, that's so, right. <laughs> and they'll be like, well, I don't know. I'm on the, I'm on the fence. <laughs> Trump's going to be like, I'm turning it off now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Trump. <laughs> no, come back to us. <laughs> Clinton's not listening either. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Clinton's out. Okay. One man, these pieces of shit detectives interrogated and threatened him. So badly that he had a heart attack, not a heart attack, his heart exploded and he died. What? I'm not even kidding. Are you freaking kidding me? All they had to say too, buddy, this is even worse. We are sorry that it happened, but we are charged with conducting a kidnapped murder investigation. And we must question everyone we might think have something to do with it. So that means murder somebody? I mean, Unintentional, but I mean, let's face it, that's murder. Wow. They're just doing their job, buddy. Yeah, okay. God. Yeah. God. I mean, these guys probably like, you know, like those people that were like dead and voted for Trump? Yeah. These guys are probably like, right here. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> being dead won't stop me. Oh, yeah, buddy. Did you know, two weeks after Eric's disappearance, the St. Joseph Gazette began demanding answers from Nomis. Okay. So the media's all pissed off that you know they're not catching anybody yeah which i don't i don't blame them but it's like you guys didn't care when you were trampling the crime scene no i didn't care at all 
Yeah, this is this whole thing is it makes you so pissed off. It's like, hey, forget this is a four year old. Yeah. Like that's what matters. You know what I mean? That yeah. that should be what matters. Yeah. The people of St. Joseph and indeed the entire area are vitally interested in seeing the slayer of Eric Christian apprehended and brought to trial. This is a quote from the newspaper. The massive public massive public involvement in the search for him is evidence of our concern. The public has a right to better and more complete information about the investigation that it has been getting. Mm-hmm. Fox's death, who is the man that his heart exploded after okay. being interrogated, right. Yep. Yep. Right. was a blow to no investigation. And 11 days later, on day 21 of his existence, the special squad was disbanded. Oh, really? <laughs> its officers had pursued 231 leads, questioned 450 people at least once. Jeez. A third of them were questioned a second time. Mm -hmm. 12,000 man hours were spent on the case. Mm -hmm. 21 people underwent hypnosis. (laughs) And 12 took polygraph tests. After officers felt they had gone over every lead, they had studied them again. In looking back, I will admit that Nomis did make some mistakes. Sheriff Fleck said. Nomis. Definitely was not a (laughs) Nomis. No, definitely not. (laughs) But this was our first case. And we have learned some things the hard way. I feel sure that this case will probably be solved. Probably. Probably. Yeah, that's good. But that might be some time down the road. <laughs> this guy's not <laughs> spouting confidence hands, at yeah. all. When we're not doing the, <laughs> the investigation. <laughs> if we were not disbanded, we would have solved the case and got the right person. Right. Right. And we will pick this up next week, buddy. We will, won't we? So, yeah. what do you think so far? Well, so my introduction was... That he killed multiple people over many decades. Oh, we'll get to it. We only got to one. Yeah, we'll get to it. So stay tuned. Yes. And this is the most, in my opinion, I mean, anybody gets murdered is horrible. Yeah. But this is just like, I don't know, something, you know what I mean? Because he's so young, it's horrible. Yeah, this is rough. I mean, I mean my just, daughter was four freaking a month ago. Yeah. The you way she I mean? died, or the, way, the way he died is just like, it's tragic. It's, it's like one of the worst that I think I've heard. It, it, it ranks up there with James Bulger. But, I mean, James that Bulger's. threw me for a loop, buddy, because I wrote this, like, maybe I found this, like, a couple days after we um, we did the last episode, you know, and then I had written the first episode, and then I, I like, took a break, and then I wrote the second episode, maybe, whatever, yeah. whenever after, and then I really had it in my head. I must have, like, blocked it out because it was so horrible. I really, I would have bet you money he was strangled. I really... Yeah. Blocked it out. Like, it was that bad. Like, yeah. I'm going to try and block it out. It's like that much. <laughs> yeah, it's so, sad, buddy. So, yeah. Um, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we will talk to you next week. Yes. And uh, don't forget to tell the ones you hold dear that you love them. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.